Looking at history through the lens of religiosity, we are going through faith-based paradigm shift with no avatar. In the absence of such a great spiritual teacher, I think we're all floating on a river that's gaining speed and we're not sure where we're going because there isn't a unifying theosophy. Good morning, brothers and sisters. My warmest welcome to our podcast, Creativity and Crisis. My name is Dr. Glenn T. Martin. For a number of years, I've been president of the World Constitution and Parliament Association, an organization working to address our planetary crises and to establish an enduring and liberating human future. I'm also a philosopher by profession who loves thinking and creative vision and inspiring ideas. My newest book is called Design for a Living Planet, the Earth Constitution Solution. In these podcasts, I engage in dialogue with prominent thinkers, scholars, and activists who are similarly concerned about the multitude of crises confronting humanity. Are there creative and practical solutions, and how can these solutions be achieved? I hope our listeners will both stay with us and join us in the thought processes that have become an utterly necessary part of our quest to create a decent planetary civilization for everyone. My guest today is Reverend Laura M. George, J.D. She's a retired attorney and executive director of the Oracle Institute, a 501c3 educational charity. She has received her undergraduate degree in commerce from the University of Virginia and law degree from Boston University. Her ministerial training was through the Interfaith Order of Maletchajik. The Oracle Institute uh, it serves as an advocate for peace and a vanguard of conscious evolution in the world. Its formal mission statement is Thomas Jefferson's Act for Religious Freedom. It serves as a spiritual think tank and also as a nexus for religion, politics, human rights, and conscious evolution. Reverend George often writes about the trickle-down deity theory, which posits humanity's view of the Godhead as necessarily defining all cultural experience. The Peace Pentagon at the Oracle Institute is in Independence, Virginia. It is a home of an award-winning publishing house, a faith spirituality school, and international peace-building practice. It is also the U.S. headquarters for the Earth Constitution Institute and the heart of the Valley of Light community, the soul of the Oracle Temple, an esoteric church founded by Reverend George. Well, Laura, it's great to have you with us on the podcast. Uh, We've known each other for a number of years, and, and I'm very interested to discuss with you the idea of crisis in the world, whether there's a crisis going on in your view and so on and how we can creatively respond. What is your take on it? Is there a global crisis? Well, yes, I think we are in a global crisis. It's not for lack of creativity on the ground, yet despite the work of many light workers and activists and progressives and philosophers such as yourself, I do believe we are in the depths of probably the greatest crisis in human history. And the reason I believe that is because looking at history through the lens of religiosity, spirituality, I have a sort of different lens that I use when evaluating where we are collectively, where humanity is. And what concerns me is that we are going through a spiritual or faith-based paradigm shift with no avatar because we're global and it's not as though another Buddha can arrive, another Jesus can arrive, another uh, Muhammad can arrive to guide a territorial sort of culture and lead people toward the light. I don't think there's anyone going to arrive. We, we are the ones we have been waiting for. So in the absence of such a great spiritual teacher, I think we're all sort of floating on a river that's gaining speed And we're not sure where we're going because there isn't a unifying theosophy yet. So that's what I would like to talk about today. Um, 
So just to be clear, the things like uh, the global environmental problem, right? The collapse of the ecosystem of the planet, the wars going on around the world, a massive poverty in the world, the threat of nuclear holocaust, uncontrollable pandemics. You would trace those back to the spiritual crisis that we're going through. What should we be doing? What have we not done? And where should we be going? You say there's no Buddha or Mohammed or Christ, but there must be some direction that you think we need to be moving in and in some lack of understanding that we need to be moving from to pass through this crisis. So at Oracle, and we do consider ourselves a spiritual think tank, we believe that all of those dreadful situations that you described, such as the environmental collapse, quality of wealth, and I mean, the list goes on and on, that those are all frontline symptoms of a spiritual disease. Uh, We call this the trickle-down deity theory, that Uh your view of the Godhead is going to necessarily impact how you view and operate in the world. So because we have these clashing belief systems, which have yet to fully integrate and evolve, that's why we think spirituality, if you peel the layers off the onion, what's at the heart of our collective inability to move forward in a rational and compassionate manner is a faith crisis. So you've asked me what we do about that. Things we do about that is have the interfaith community recognize it and rather than continue to stake out turf, so to speak, you know, when you get down to the, the micro congregational level or whether you're talking at a, at a macro level with the religions, we need to acknowledge that we're in uncharted territory spiritually, just like we're in uncharted territory with technology and you know, AI coming and, and all these other crises. So what we believe is a proper path forward is first to admit that that's the situation and then study how shifts have happened in the past. The best way to predict the future is to build it, but you have to understand also historically how humans have evolved. You know, the new age community has this belief that we're gonna wake up one day, you know, December 20, 21st, 2012 was this huge mark, you know, <laughs> milestone for them. And uh-huh. people literally thought the next day we'd wake up and the paradigm would shift. So I call that the, the new age rapture scenario. And then we have fundamentalists who similarly think, you know, their avatar is going to return and we're going to wake up one day and the planet's going to shift. So the first thing we need to do is disabuse people of these fantasies. Okay, (laughs) evolution is messy. Sometimes it's two steps forward, one step back. Other days it's reverse. So we need to we need to be mature about that. We need to we need to be honest with ourselves. Here, what we study to understand the reality on the ground is what I call Maslow on steroids. We follow very closely in analyzing ourselves, our guests, our students, Ken Wilber's body of work, which is stacked on top of Spiral Dynamics, which is Don Beck and Chris Cohen's body of work. And that model really helps understand what's happening, both in terms of the culture wars and the spiritual chaos. Mm -hmm. You didn't mention secularity, right? You you didn't mention the growing lack of interest in religion that has taken place in the past, at least in the past century. Uh, The uh, fundamentalists and the, the New Age, they have these spiritual ideas that are not rational and not historically accurate. What about secularity? Is that a problem? Is that a loss of interest in the things divine or loss of an idea of a godhead or a, a spiritual source of things? How does that fit in? What you're... Usually when people get to the point where they know there's not a guy in the sky who's judging them on a daily basis and so on and so forth, hell and brimstone stuff. There's usually a period in which people have to leave religion altogether. They need a break. They need to Uh reevaluate. Now, sometimes they'll quickly move into what, you know, I'm using this term new age meme. That's really pluralism. That's that's the beginning of a world centric view. 
it's a beginning. You know, these are the people who now understand that, for instance, universal health care should be a right. Mm -hmm. um, so people tend to move from fundamentalism into that limbo place where, you know what, I'm just going to leave God and all of that alone for a while. And, and secularism becomes very, very popular. Sometimes they'll move into the pluralistic meme. But secularism can, can continue through the next couple stages if you look at this research. So, for instance, millennials have a very nature-based, I'm going to use the word spirituality, they might not, but they're into nature mysticism. They want to hike. They want to commune with nature. They want to be on top of a mountain feeling one with the all. Mm -hmm. Again, this is my language, not theirs, mm -hmm. but it is a form of spirituality. Mm -hmm. So even atheists who claim a complete disbelief, frankly, because they've gone beyond ethnocentric views of the world, they are sharing of themselves. They're concerned about the planet and all the things that you address in your book. Uh -huh. So anyway, yes, uh, the secular community is critical to helping us progress. I mean, they, they're the ones who do believe in science. They're the ones who, you know, yeah. they're not part of the problem. Let's just put it that way. They're not part of the problem. Yeah, there's a certain kind of secular community that seems to uh, have a kind of a, a nihilistic, a, a non-value base, a, a power base. So I, you think of the people in the Pentagon, for example, they may or may not profess some religion, but they think that the world uh, needs to be dealt with in terms of power concepts and not justice concepts. If we're looking about toward a great transition, right, getting through this period, um, there, there's immense, immense changes that have to take place in consciousness on, on a broad spectrum of uh, human beings, right? The pen, how are we going to deal with the Pentagon? How are we going to deal with people who have billions and billions of dollars uh, that are being used to potentially destroy even all of humanity. If we move to this, uh, the new level, I wonder if you could articulate how are those going to operate in the world? If we're, how are we going to create an ecologically sound future? Okay, so the, the good news is that the, fa the fastest growing meme is the pluralistic meme. Millennials get their really fast. Uh, and by that, I mean, they're not tribalistic. They're not ethnocentric. They uh -huh. seem to almost pop out of the womb with a world centric view. So that's the good news. Uh -huh. um, the bad news is that the guys who have their fingers on the red buttons. <laughs> right. To, uh, to, to hit to, to press the button for a nuclear warhead. Um, and in all those power positions, are still predominantly at a level of consciousness that you just described. Yeah. That power and fear are big motivators, selfishness, all of these, you know, to use again some religious terms, sins are still embedded. A greed is embedded. A desire to dominate is running through the spectrum of consciousness. I, I totally agree. You mentioned the Pentagon. What, one way that we deal with that militaristic mentality is we built the Peace Pentagon, which is yes. what we're doing at the Oracle campus. Yes. Um, and education is the key. What the research shows is that you can't talk someone to a higher level of consciousness. You can't talk them into an awareness that they have yet to experience. However, education is key. That's also what we do with the Oracle Institute. I know that's what you do at your institute as well, the Earth Constitution Institute. In terms of globally, I think because the fastest growing meme are the pluralists and what we call second tier humans in the, in the Ken Wilbur integral model, um, second tier humans are at the pluralistic level plus, the green meme plus. There's about 20% of the planet maybe 25% of the planet at that level of consciousness currently. That could be enough yeah. for the tipping point to occur. Could you, could you explain for our listeners what you mean by second tier? 
Sure. Okay. So the green pluralistic meme, as I said before, is the first meme that starts viewing the world as non-separate. It's a first step. These are baby colts on wobbly legs. Uh However, they do get it. They do get it. Now, under pressure, they might regress. Fear might creep in, but they do get it. Once you go to second tier, however, these are people who've moved beyond pluralism into active participation and creating a better world. They're not just talking about it. They're walking the walk. And in fact, most of them are compelled to assist. So once you reach second tier, not only do you view this planet as being populated by brothers and sisters, regardless of class, culture, race, religion, Uh all of that, Uh you also have the ability to use a systems view approach. It's it's like the puzzle pieces start fitting together. Uh And once you reach that systems theory approach, the philosophical underpinnings really shift. You can you can see how the dominoes fall. You know, if I do X, Y happens. If I do Y, Z happens. And also, you know, this other thing may happen. And you're able to really comprehend the complexity, but also the beauty of the earth plane. Uh So things like duality start making sense. You start understanding how polarity works. You're understanding how to overcome polarity. It's, it's the, it's the level of diplomatic. You could, we could use that word or even masterful level that uh-huh. kicks in once you're able to experience oneness on a regular basis. Uh-huh. That's the difference between the green meme and second tier. Second tier is feeling the oneness on a regular basis. I see. And when you say people become capable of a kind of systems view and be are able to put the pieces together, Does that resonate with uh, Barbara Marx Hubbard and other people who talk about conscious evolution? Yeah, that's that's a perfect way of summing summing it up. It's the connections. They do. They see how everything fits together and they become, and the people I know, practically obsessed with assisting. They're effective. They're highly effective. Um, Another hallmark of a second tier human is that ego is completely under control. It's not that ego is gone, but people are doing things for the right reasons. There aren't ulterior motives. I mean, they really genuinely at a heart level want to assist humanity and they're impactful as a result. They're more impactful than say activists who, you know, march down, uh, you know, Independence Boulevard in DC. Um, I mean, they really, because they have a systems view of, of the situation, they're the ones who can solve crises best. They're, they're the leaders of the future. Wilbur says there's only about 5% of those on the planet, however. Uh-huh. But let's talk about the tipping point a little bit more because when Wilbur writes about the tipping point, he discusses the fact that at the founding of the United States, maybe only 10% of the colonists we're in it for the long haul. We're willing to, you know, put, put their, their neck in a noose if, if need be for uh, freedom. Uh, so about 10% of the colonists carried the day. He said he talks about the civil rights movement in the United States. Similarly, about 10% of the country was ready for uh, what President Johnson was doing with civil rights legislation and all of that. But that carried the day. Uh So I do believe we're getting close to a tipping point in that the fastest growing meme again are the pluralists. And that does include most secular people, the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, the people who, who, when they self-report for Pew uh, polls, Pew research polls, they'll call themselves nuns. I don't affiliate with anything. Uh But again, they're some of the most moral and compassionate people I I know. So Uh if we can rally that there and everyone at that point is world centric if we can rally that world centric population that's a that's a pretty big chunk and that is why for instance i'm very optimistic that the earth constitution is going to be readily understood and accepted and cheered 
you know, I'm, I'm involved with, with your organization. And I really think the time has come for that document to reach a broader audience that's, that understands it. I mean, understanding it is, is the most critical yeah. part. The uh, examples that you, you use coming from Ken Wilber are major changes that took place in the United States when 10% of the population was ready for it. But now we have to, I take it, be thinking in terms of the world, 10% of the world. So the Earth Constitution would have to appeal worldwide, right? Mm -hmm. So is it your sense that this kind of rapid transition of consciousness is happening in places like Russia and China and India and around the world as well as in the United States? I, I actually do. Well, first off, Europe's greener than we are. I mean, Europe was ahead of the United States in terms of pluralistic values. So yeah. that's good news. But yes, we see these pockets, even in countries that which are still controlled by dictators, these, these pockets of resistance, which are preaching the values that are second tier. So there's lots of leaders out there, even in dismal situations, fighting for the common good. And I do think we're on the verge of this tipping point. The danger, of course, is again, is that the people in the seats of power are not at this level of consciousness. So in order for us to talk about a global, a planetary shift, we're going to need to dislodge these people from power. They're just, they're never going to get it. I mean, they're just not. They're dinosaurs. Yeah. They're not going to get it. Yeah. It's that which makes this cusp, we call it the great, the great cusp at Oracle. I mean, these, these kinds of shifts only occur every few thousand years. I mean, the last time we had a shift of this magnitude, Jesus walked the earth. I mean, this is a huge shift that we're talking about. So in order to accomplish that, we've got to unseat these demagogues, these uh, people just with a level of consciousness that doesn't allow them to comprehend. They just don't see it. They don't get it yet. They yeah. just don't get it. No, in my own travels around the world, I, I find that people everywhere have a real uh, nationalism, a real kind of loyalty to their own. They identify their culture, their language, and so on to their own location in the world. Of course, historically, a lot of nations have only become so-called sovereign or free since the Second World War. India became sovereign in in 1947. In many African nations, only in the 1960s, and uh, so we have in the world this uh, kind of clinging to the idea that freedom has to do with this sovereignty of nation states. All right, but I but I take it if the spiritual transformation is going to take place that you're talking about, people will have to disabuse themselves of that idea. Right, they'll be have to be thinking in terms of a of a global family of brothers and sisters, as you mentioned earlier, is that correct? And, and fortunately, all the avatars who've ever hit the planet shared that, you can term, use the term commandment or best high and highest wish for us. And that is the golden rule. I mean, it's in every, it's in every religion, it's in every moral code, it's in every yes. culture. So yes. drawing upon the best of humanity also makes this possible. The danger, though, just because I don't want to minimize the danger here, the people in power who are at a lower level of consciousness, they will fight to the death to retain the status quo. We are in a dangerous gambit. And while those at second tier do understand duality and have ex experienced non-duality, the reality on the ground is we are in a highly polarized planet. Yeah. It's the most polarized it's ever been. You know, we had Trump in the United States. We've, we've got a rise in dictatorship around the world. Uh, the democracy index is indicating that democracy around the globe is actually falling back. It's not just yeah. the United States. So countries that were formerly looking like they were absolutely moving forward a step every day now are falling back. Yeah. And But that is that too is a symptom of this impending shift because you know, it's darkest right before the dawn. The issue though is, can we get through this period? I mean, this is exceedingly dangerous. It's, it's right. exceedingly dangerous. So 
and then we haven't even talked about technology. I mean, we've got we do, we've got this technology. We've got geniuses on the planet building machinery and technology that we don't have the wisdom to control collectively. Right. We don't have the wisdom. And I'm I'm writing my third book right now, and there's a phrase I use a few times in it. We literally have barbarians and Buddhas on the same planet. I mean, that's how vast <laughs> yeah. the spectrum yeah. of consciousness is: barbarians and Buddhas. Um, so we've got lots of people who've reached the stage of uh, awareness, the state of awareness that Buddha had. I mean, think about it. Back yeah. in the day, these avatars were so rare. Now, there are a lot of people who've, who have reached or near reaching enlightenment. And then we have people who would absolutely shoot you for and the barbarians have, control. The barbarians seem to have the power right now, as you were saying. And uh, yeah. Uh, so it's very a very dangerous uh, situation. For those who have already entered the pluralist green main, that, that would be the new age community. That would also be people who are secular, who are very aware of what's happening in the world. There's a dangerous but commonly repeated mantra in this meme and it goes something like this you can't save the world until you save yourself uh -huh. you can't bring peace to the world until you bring peace to yourself you can't heal the world until you heal yourself uh -huh. okay yes true fine but we are in a global war zone now yes the stakes are high so my parting thought to those who may be continuing to work on themselves while that is exceedingly important and of course your practice is important we don't have the luxury of time anymore you've got to start practicing you on the streets yeah or with a profit, right or, on you know your, your local food bank whatever it's time to get out and get off your meditative pillow Put the incense out a little early here it's time to get busy or we are not going to make it if yeah team yeah. light as i call it in my book if team light doesn't become more active and by that i also mean run for office we've got to dislodge these yeah. people from our yeah. positions right so yuck who wants to do that it's, it's a shitty job <laughs> who wants to get into politics right. but we do so if you can if you have the personality and the talent and the education, run for office. If you can start a school, start a school. If you can knock door to door and you're one of these people who is effective in that way. I, I heard a show the other night and this African-American woman in Georgia was going door to door trying to convince people to get the vaccine. She was spent up to an hour Fantastic. talking to people and yeah. they would get the vaccine. Okay, so maybe that's your gift. Maybe that's your talent. You will put one on one. But Find out inside what your gift is, what you have to offer, and get busy because we need you. We need you to help, or we're not going to make it over the finish line into the new paradigm that we all want. Uh, excellent. A wonderful parting message, Laura, the, uh, and a great conversation. Thank you so much. And uh, oh, Thank you. So, to our listeners, I hope you have enjoyed today's dialogue about establishing a living future for the earth and for all future generations. Our podcast has been recorded and the link will be streamed to multiple social media outlets and posted on my own website at oneworldrenaissance.com. I would love to hear your thoughts and reactions to this exciting conversation. You can email me at gmartin at earthconstitution.world. This podcast has been made in association with Everscope Multimedia. Thank you all so much for listening, and I hope you have a wonderful day and a wonderful week, and that you will join us in creativity and crisis at the same time and place next week. Goodbye for now, be well, and God bless.